and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is staff journalist Tom hey. and senior journalist Richard. Hello. This week, we're looking at Ford's upcoming Evos, a family SUV for global markets and potentially a Falcon and Territory replacement in one. Um, we'll discuss a trio of recent entries to the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with the king of semi-controlled explosions in this week's Muskwatch. Um, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. And look, in typical Byron fashion, he has done a deep swan dive into what is likely to be called the Ford Evos. Um, it's an all-important replacement for the Mondeo, and I think that was, that was Fusion in, in US markets, um, a medium-sized crossover rather than, than a, a typical SUV, think Subaru Outback, um, and to put them back into family car consideration across the world. And for our, our listeners in Australia and New Zealand, um, it's been patented. The name Evos has been patented globally, uh, or at least there's applications, and that extends to Australia and New Zealand. So it looks like it's heading here. So to kick it off, guys, I just wonder what you think. You know, Territory was a, a pretty good success, actually, for Ford Australia, while Falcon was just withering on the vine. Um, where do you see a wagon-style Ford family offering fitting into the, the overall picture? Is it potentially successful or where do you see it? Well, they need one because <laughs> they've lost the Endura, um, yeah. which was supposed to be, uh, well, you know, even though they told us when, when we went to the launch of the Endura that it's not a replacement for the, uh, for the territory. It's just like, you know, when your, your mum gets remarried and the new fella says, you know, look, I'm not a replacement for your dad, but you know he is. Yes, right? you just get know. to bed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, get to bed. <laughs> That's right. Pick up your shoes. Pick up right? your shoes and get yeah, to bed. bed. Brush my teeth. Well, yeah. He wouldn't say that, would he? No. Um, but um, look, it depends because if this is based on the Mondeo and the Mondeo was Australian-wise a complete flop, even though it was probably one of the best cars that Ford's ever produced. It was a terrific a car. Yeah. Um, so uh, look, we saw the Evos in 2011 come out at the Frankfurt Motor Show. It was stunning. It actually looked way ahead of its time, unlike a lot of concepts, which just look completely you know, fanciful and never will make it in production. I thought it looked good then. This yeah. looks good now. Byron's story is actually really, really good. I haven't seen much about this out there. Yes. Um, look, it's, it's, it's definitely where uh, transport's going, these sort of, you know, e-tron style uh you know suv is it an suv is it a wagon is it a is it a regular passenger car i think ford's really hoping that it works ford's yep. got another problem as well in australia and that is that we we source a lot of our cars from europe um and yep. europe ford is going electric in the next 10 years so if we don't start thinking about what cars we're going to have here we're going to yep. have no fords apart from the ranger and mustang so bring it on i say there are already accusations, aren't there, that mm. um, you know Ford in Australia is the the Mustang and Ranger, well, mainly the Ranger company. So they they need to diversify somewhat, don't you? Yeah, that? yeah. Tom. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think uh, Mondeo was actually a great car. Um, I think uh, you and I, JC, talked about the last time we had one in, which feels like an eon ago now. Um, it was an Evo. It was actually an Evo. An, an, an Evo ago. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it and it. I, I remember at the time thinking, "Wow, like people are sleeping on this. Like it's actually it's a really nice car to drive. Like uh, it's well, got well hidden secret." Yeah, it got really good practicality. That EcoBoost engine's fantastic. Um, and the idea of repackaging it into a more consumable format is brilliant um, because yep. that's essentially what this is. It's, it's like a, a, a true Mondeo successor. It's not just, yep. uh, you know, a complete reinvention. It, it's basically the same thing, just high riding. And I was reading an interesting article yesterday. Uh, it was US focused. So I don't remember whether it was Jalopnik or something, but um, yep. they were talking about how it's very odd that Subaru's Outback, which is essentially the same thing, like it's, you know, that lifted kind of crossover concept, 
is the only successful one. Like, like yep. you know, uh, XC70 might have had its time in the sun, you know, 15 yep. years ago, that sort of thing. But yes. how come we don't have more of these? Like, it, oh. it's a really sensible you, you, body You style. wonder if um, the Holden Adventure was launched into the market now. It's probably, yeah. it's tying would probably be just right. Yeah, um. yeah. And, 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 and there are, but there are other options out there, you know, for an outback competitor that haven't caught on. Like, you know, you've got yep. uh, Skoda Superb Scout and, and things like that, just yep. things that make so much sense, but people don't buy them for yep. some reason. But the outback just has that badge cred that it, it, it is so successful. Um, and I think as well, uh, for the product coming out of Ford Europe uh, now is is excellent. Like it's ta- it's taken such a big jump in terms of its quality, its drivability, yep. it's it's yep. everything. Like if you drive a new, uh, even the Puma, like that's a key product for that brand, and it is really good. So yes, y- you know, I, I have high hopes for this thing. I think I think it's well, great. Uh, according well. according to Byron's Mail. Um, it's likely to be on this C2 architecture, um, which underpins things like the Focus and the Bronco Sports, so the, the Mini Bronco and the Marquee uh, Mustang. And with that comes an electronic architecture that will facilitate Sync 4 multimedia. Um, he's theorising that it will probably have your full-length display all in one touchscreen. Think Mercedes M Bucks, you know, the MBUX mm. system to really bring forward from the you know lower part of the pile to to the top, Um, that's important too because the inside of Fords have been, you know, functional but not exactly inspiring uh, Mm. for some time. So there'll be that as well. Uh, Look, I I think um, it'll be well-made, all Fords are. I think it will look good, all Fords are. But I think it will be overpriced because all (laughs) Fords are. Um, And this seems to be the, you know, the disaster (laughs) Uh, you know, the, the makings of a disaster for Ford because they do produce these great cars. The, you know, the current generation Ford Focus is excellent, um, yep. but it's just a little bit too expensive, especially if when you're playing at that end of the market, when you're competing in a Mazda 3 and, and stuff like that. Um, look, I just looking at these renderings of it that we've got on the website, it does look like a, a cool looking thing. It looks a bit Tesla-ish. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm waiting for stuff like, the electric Mustang um, SUV sure. to come out to Australia, which, sure. you know, apparently at this point, according to Ford, it's not, but right. they need to, I think they need to push in that direction more. I think our, our watchword or our fr- key phrase um, here on the podcast is, but you never know, oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> Palisade was mm. never going to come here. Mm. Uh, various other things were never going to come here. So you never think, know. Look, I think, look, this is, this is, this is another case of not quite hitting the mark because really what Ford needs to produce and you, you just, you know, said it then they need to produce a Kia Sorento rival. That's not right. a ladder frame chassis right. um, in a, for, for us, for the Australian market, mm-hmm. not another overpriced, well-made car. Well, um, I don't know. I suppose we can we can theorise about um, Ford's track record in terms of market pricing and the spec level that they choose mm. uh, for here. But what what we do know, or oh, sorry, what what Byron is pretty certain about is mm. that the engine in this thing will be initially a two mm. litre four cylinder turbo petrol, one eighty three yep. kilowatts, three eighty seven newton meters, yep. same as in the Escape uh, yep. medium SUV. That'll be the mainstream or yep. mainstay. Yep. Then you've got. Uh, a 2.5 litre petrol electric hybrid and a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle um, yep. in front and all wheel drive. So mm. look, there'd be a lot of bases covered there. So you never yep. know where the price spread is going to go from, from here to there. Um, and I think those things sound very smart in terms of making it more flexible in the powertrain. Absolutely. I agree with, I agree with Richard though. Like, like what Ford actually needs is the Explorer. Yeah. <laughs> Like something yeah. like that, like a big kind of yeah. in your face, seven seat SUV, uh, right. you know, has a bit of that adventure yeah. capability, you know, yeah. that's the product that we this, see for them. This is not going to work. This Evo oh, okay. is not going to work because okay. it's not what people want, right? Really? They, 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 you know, I know that contradicts what I said at the beginning, but like there's enough of these cars out already and what Ford actually it's, it is what people want, but it's not what Ford needs. What Ford needs <laughs> is a large SUV that sits eight people. That's not gotcha. the not the Everest. Right. Um, they right. need a Kia Sorento rival. They need a Palisade rival, and they don't have those. Yeah, um, that could be a very simple one-page brief. 
uh, to product <laughs> planning and design and engineering. Yeah. Uh, because yes. they'll go to, they'll, seriously, Ford will go to town. They'll get someone from France to design this car. They'll get somebody from Belgium to, you know, to make the interior. They'll get someone from the US to, you know, uh, I don't know, yeah. make the coffee. Okay. And they'll, they'll, spend a lot of, they'll spend a lot of money producing it. And all they need to do is bring out the Explorer, as yeah. Tom said. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I agree. At the end of the day, like this will, this will look great. We'll yes. love it, yes. but I don't think it's set for yep. mass widespread no. success. You know, okay. it'll be removed from the Australian market within twelve months <laughs> after arrival. Wow! I've, look, I'm this starting that. Myself. I'm starting yeah. the list now. We've got yeah. to mark these things down. <laughs> okay. I That's it. Be... I did, two years ago, I said there'd be no Tesla in twelve months. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You don't have a great track record. So withdrawn. Um, it's not even released yet, but you've got it withdrawn <laughs> after 12 months. 12 so we're talking a, a, April in 12 months when we do this podcast, yeah. we'll have to check in. What's yeah. really maybe, maybe how long did Enduro last for? <laughs> not long, about 12 months. Uh, yeah. 12 months. I give it as um, long as the Endura. The Endura, because... which didn't endure at all. We're saying it's codenamed CD542, according to Byron, and it's set to start production either late this year or in 2022. Mm-hmm. So if it comes in into here, maybe it's late 2022. So you're saying by late 2023, yep. EVOS will be history in this market. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'm <laughs> plotting the demise of a car that hasn't even been launched yet. <laughs> That's right. I, would, I hope I'm wrong. You know, I love, I like Ford as a brand. They produce fantastic cars, um, but they just need a, a big seven seater. Yeah. Right. It's, right. That's the thing, right? Like, mm. in, like we'll love this car. Mm. We will. <laughs> People won't Well, buy it. look, Byron, given his historical bent, uh, also drew some lines between the Evos uh, and the Falcon as a spiritual successor for Falcon. And he said, look, if that's far fetched, keep in mind that the two share a similar do or die brief, even if they're separated by 60 years. The XK Falcon original was breakaway from the ever-growing full-sized American behemoths and comparatively compact dimensions and low-slung styling designed to tap into changing consumer tastes. Not only did it save Ford, but it was the later, later the basis of the Mustang. No. So what he's saying is this, this is a spiritual Falcon successor. No, look, the What's successor to the Falcon is the Toyota RAV4, you know. Um, wow. Because that's what families have moved into. They've dropped their Falcon and Commodore and they've gone for a RAV4, or a Celtos or a Sorento. I feel yeah. like Richard's just going for soundbite. <laughs> no, right? I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking Big the declaration. truth. I'm speaking the truth here. Okay. Well, very good. So, so to say that a successor for the for the Falcon, did Byron say that or is that a Ford marketing speech? That was one Byron Matthew Darkus who yeah. uh, drew He's those. Taken up a job at Ford as he a drew those lines. PR manager. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yes. it would be, uh, I think that's, that's a really good uh, discussion. I think it'd be great to get people's feedback too. Um, mm. on what they make of the potential for a vehicle yeah. like the Evos, five-seat crossover rather than full-on SUV, four-cylinder turbo petrol to kick off, but with you know hybrid and plug-in hybrid as well. Mm. Is it going to do enough to swing people away from, I mean, you guys called it, the likes of the RAV4, um, and will it compete in the outback space or will it be somewhere else? Um, be great to hear. And And is it going to be overpriced? Do we think Ford could take a a deep breath and actually uh, sharpen their pencil and make it a little more competitive on the price front. Hope so too. Yeah. All right. Now we'll, we'll move from that to our own garage and we'll talk about cars that we've been driving. Richard, um, you're potentially, you've been in one of one here, maybe. I I don't know how many cars of this spec would be in Australia at the moment, but fill us in. Let me just, uh, let me just give everyone a hint. My left leg feels bigger than my right leg lately. Mm. Um, and that's okay. because I have been driving a car with a clutch, clutch pedal. Yep. Um, it's just, to, I- just for most of the audience, can you fill us in on what that is, what that means? <laughs> a lot of people won't really know. I know. Let me, let me, let me get my whiteboard out and I'll explain yeah. how a manual There's a gearbox, flywheel, there's a cr- clutch plate, work, pressure plate. Disengages yeah. the clutch. The three pedals. Pad comes in. Yep. Three pedals. That's right. I've been driving an i30N. Sorry, no, I haven't been. I've been driving an i 30 it's the N line, so it looks like an N, but it's just dressed up to look like one. It's got a 1.6 litre turbo and it's got a manual six-speed gearbox. Um, and uh, it's a sedan, uh, so which is, you know, I haven't actually driven the um, i30 sedan yet, 
Um, and it's not, you know, even though the i30 hatch is a small car, the i30 sedan does not feel small at all. Um, it's quite a, you know, elongated, you know, luxurious, swooping, looking fast back type of car. Um, it's the, the manual has, when it's the first time I got it, I was driving everywhere really fast. Like I was <laughs> Bruce Willis out of Pulp Fiction in that Honda Civic. Okay. Um, and then after about two days of driving in city traffic and, you know, sitting on hills and, um, you know, bumper to bumper, you know, peak hour, you know, crush, the manual's novelty was starting to wear off. Um, it's such a good manual though. It's really light, really. I was thinking to myself, if you were learning to drive a manual, it would be a great one to start off on. It's very forgiving, uh, very light clutch in it. Um, but then there's all the other i30 hallmarks as well. There's great steering. There's the great ride, um, and it's just been it's been a it's been a really enjoyable car to drive. But in terms of practicality, though, um, I was a bit disappointed. I had right. some um, clivias to pick up. Um, it's not a sexually transmitted disease. It's a no. um, they're a type of plant, uh, and I bought some on Gumtree, our sister hey. website, and um, okay. actually did actually and. Um, they didn't quite fit in in the boot and I broke all the flowers off, which was disappointing. Wow. Yes, right. because the boot's so swooping. And then we, um, my wife. Um, but hold bought... on, just, just before, was this, <laughs> did you leave them over the edge and kind of cut them off like a guillotine when you brought the door down? Because I'm, I'm a Neanderthal. I bent them to go in the boot and, um, <laughs> and they snapped off. Plants, not very hey. robust. Yep, we pick green. Just we'll just call you Green Thumbs Berry. Green thumbs, all thumbs Berry. All thumbs um, Berry. Then uh, my wife bought a um, uh, a table on eBay, another website, uh, you know, our sister website, and um, and the tables had trouble trying to fit in the boot as well. I mean, yeah. you know, it wasn't they were trying to fit themselves in. They had trouble. <laughs> It yeah. wasn't a dining table, though, those little small tables. I'll get them out and show you later. Um, okay. And that had trouble as well. So I was thinking to myself, man, if this had been the hatch, they would have fit in. And that's yep. the reason why hatches are so popular. And it's not sure. because their shape is so pleasing to the eye, but they're also yes. more practical. So Yes. It's that's interesting, isn't it? That that whole uh, thing of, you know, you can look at the literage of a boot mm. in a sedan and it's yeah. almost always bigger than a hatch yes. or a SUV. Mm. Yes. But then actually the space isn't as useful for a lot of things. Yeah. It it's absolutely the size point. of the aperture. Yeah. Yes. yeah, that's right. I mean, if you're and filling it with milk, it would be better, but you're not. Yeah, yeah that's right. But the you probably need some baffles in the boot there to stop things Ooh. getting out of control <laughs> in the cornering. Yeah, smell afterwards. Um, but when you think about it, you know, mm. the move away from sedans was initially to small hatchbacks, mm. then SUVs with a hatchback, yes. which was progressing the thing even yes. further. But um, yeah, that's an interesting wake up or yeah. reminder, isn't it? Of yes. how limited a boot can be. Yeah, now we're going say backwards as well, with the Evos. Yeah. To, <laughs> I'm going to say as well, I love that car's predecessor, like the i30 sedan, like the Elantra SR. Yes. That was such a fun car. And I think a lot of people just look like look straight past it. It had sort of kind of wily looks and it was really fun to drive though. Is, are, mm. are people are going to buy these cars. I mean, I hate to be the death speaker here, but like who buys the a death sedan? death speaker. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I see a few of them around. If you had though. that as your online handle... I think the, the authorities would be sniffing around. Death speaker. The death speaker. Yeah. If I did, if you come on and it's and I'm there and I go, hello, that person dies in 24 hours. Right. But so you think, sorry, I cut you off. You were yeah. talking about the uh, car. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was just saying. It's just saying that are people you know, are people in the market for a sedan anymore? I, yeah. I'm not sure why uh, a car company makes them anymore. If, as you said, um, you know, people aren't buying them, and as well, a manual sedan. Yeah, come on. Yes, like seriously. that's what I'm saying. That'll be a very interesting car mm. in the secondhand market. <clears throat> the one that you drove. <laughs> yes. It'll be it'll be a rare car later. It'll be on Shannon's, you know, auctions yeah. or, or yeah. whatever. The last manual in Australia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the one one of one. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's good. And just to put you on the spot, Richard, um, what price bracket are we talking about? Roundabouts. Um, look, it, the sedan and the hatch pricing uh, mimics 
uh, mimic each other. So they mirror each other. So you're looking at around about, oh, look, gosh, you know, I 30 started around, you know, low twenties. Yep. So your, your um, end line is up there with your elite. So you're looking at um, mid thirties for that. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. a lot, you know, it's a, Far out, you know. I've I've, I've just driven. Um, I can't mention the name, but I, you know, a prestige uh, car, and you have to pay for. You have to option a lot of the things which come standard on yeah, an I thirty yeah. end line. So it's good value. Cool, really good value. Good, good, good. Thank mm. you, Richard. Uh, thank you. Now uh, we're going to move to your good self, Tom, and you've been in another Hyundai, and please tell us about this one. It's a really interesting one, and you know, it's uh, not. Super often that we get to drive something that's 100% a new technology. And this one is, it's the, the Nexo hydrogen fuel cell SUV. Uh, it's mm -hmm. actually been kicking around for a while now. Um, yeah. I think it, it came out in 2018 in Korea and you can actually buy that car over there. Here, yep. unfortunately, even though they did a launch for it, you can't buy the car, but they were launching it to sort of celebrate the first 20 examples that won't be on Hyundai's own test fleet. Right. Uh, the, tw the 20 cars are going to go to the ACT government. Uh, they'll be running them as fleet vehicles there. And they've got a real push for sort of a zero emissions fleet. They already run a few Leafs and Ionics right. and stuff. Yes. Um, and this is just yes. the latest edition. But the hope is, I think that there was a, a little bit less kind of focus on the car itself on this particular launch and more on the technology and, and kind of what it represents for Australia in particular, because... Uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, green power generation when it comes to, uh, you know, solar and wind and hydro. And yep. one of the one of the big complaints about those is, you know, you, you have all these uh, arguments about uh, off peak power times and this, that, the other, whatever. And the the and then people also um, talk down about uh, this kind of hydrogen fuel cell concept, saying, oh well, the problem with it is it's some order of magnitude less efficient than if you actually just had an EV because you could, with an EV, you just right. take power straight from the grid. That power is generated. It goes into the car. There's no, there's fewer losses in the uh, production chain for that per kilowatt average. Um, but the argument against that, especially in Australia for uh, hydrogen is to say, well, we can stick a huge solar generator out in the middle of the desert. And it doesn't matter whether it connects to the grid or not, because what we can do is we can run that solar generator during the day and it generates all this power and it compresses hydrogen. That's what it does with power. And it just uses all of its power to compress hydrogen because it's a power intensive process. And it puts it in these cylinders, which you can then ship back to a main center and you yep. can ship it to places that aren't even connected to the grid. So it's yes. quite versatile as a, as a power source, even though theoretically it's less efficient than having straight connection. The, the, the other thing that I find interesting, I do remember James May, the only one of that original, that, that famous Top Gear trio worth feeding. And he was talking <laughs> about um, the Honda Clarity and he was driving it in California when it had gone on sale and there was some hydrogen infrastructure had actually been put into Southern California particularly. And he was just saying how convenient it was to be able to go to a fuel station and fill up. So there are the environmental concerns and, and the, the discussion around how hydrogen is generated. But from an end user point of view, it's so much more convenient at this point anyway, to be able to actually fill up your car with something and drive an EV rather than having to, to recharge that battery. You know, the alchemy that goes on inside <laughs> an FCEV um, is, is pretty tricky, but it means it's far more convenient potentially. I think in Australia as well, um, where, you know, most of our electricity is produced by coal-fired power stations, I think hydrogen provides a sort of a more, a true environmental sort of, yeah. you know, um, emissions solution in some sure. ways until, sure. you know, energy is actually produced more renewably. You know, you're seeing Teslas drive around with number plates that say, you know, L-O-L-O-I-L, -L -L, you know, lol uh, oil. Yeah. Um, when, you know, he's, he, they're, they're actually recharging their vehicle using coal. Yeah, um, no, that, that's actually someone's name. Do, do, haven't you met? <laughs> Lolo. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Lolo. Top bloke. Yeah. Great bloke. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah, yeah. Leslie. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have seen that number played out there. So I hope he yeah. finds yeah. the podcast and comments. Maybe yes, can have a I hope so too. <laughs> have we broken the law by saying a number plate? I don't know. No. There's no, no. habit. No, we haven't. No, I don't think we, we have. haven't given out his address. 
no. going through Cranbrook Road. <laughs> I'm making that up. Will be. I think look, hydrogen's a really good um, alternative to diesel because I think uh, moving forward in the future, I think um, electric vehicles will be city-based cars. So, you know, your small sort of Corolla style um, runabouts. And here, heavy industry um, will be um, powered by hydrogen because hydrogen operates really well over long distances. Sure, that's a good Not, point, yeah. So I think, I think what you'll probably be seeing in the future is, yeah, city-based vehicles will be electric, you can plug them in, you charge them overnight, but for freight and stuff like that, it, hmm. you know, it'll, it'll be hydrogen. So I don't know if the Nexo is the right size for hydrogen. I think hydrogen's a great fuel. And it also produces pure water out of the tower. Well, I mean, Toyota's gone down the same path with the Mirai. And, hmm. and that's been really an impressive kind of vehicle uh, as yeah. well. Um, Mercedes-Benz has been, you know, experimenting with hydrogen power hmm. for a long time. There are a lot of big manufacturers wanting to explore that in case mm. there are opportunities down that road and i think i think there will be your Definitely. your heavy transport points are really good one Richard. yeah yeah it, I, it did is you have a drink true. tom did you have a drink out of the exhaust pipe <laughs> um the opportunity wasn't offered but um I, I i've heard that you can and it is quite pure um but yeah no it's interesting you do say that though richard because that is kind of the next big thing about mm. hy hydrogen is and he and i actually like like said that full on in, in australia they say mm. Everything you see now that's powered by petrol, that yep. will be an EV. That's Everything right. you see right now that's powered by diesel, that will be SEV. And yep. the thing, the thing, well, that's fuel cell electric vehicle. And the thing, and the thing about it is, um, hydrogen per kilowatt generated is much lighter than. That's the key thing. It's much lighter than uh, a lithium ion battery. And so, um, that yeah, right. Hyundai has just launched over in Europe its its Exient uh, fuel cell truck. And you, what that does is it mounts the, instead of having like a big lithium ion battery, it mounts mm. these big uh, uh, fuel cells behind the cab. And uh, that grants it like, they, they were saying something like, you know, you can get a thousand kilometers of range out of this system easily, even when yeah. you have a payload, right? And, and that's, yeah. it's that's, the same with the Nexo. Uh, that's got over 600 kilometers range and Brilliant. it only carries six kilograms. of. And then you fill it up. And then you yep. fill it up, and then you know? it takes it takes five minutes flat. That's yeah. right. It's the yeah. same uh, as putting fuel um, in your car right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Definitely. that's and that's and really if, interesting. If you did want to know just a little bit about the car, um, oh, the car, yeah, <laughs> the car itself, because I know that's what we were meant to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, cars, cars, um, cars, yeah. cars, cars. That's right. That's right. We've Stay, got on cars target. As well. Stay on target. Stay on target. Yeah. Hyundai actually agrees with you, Richard. They they were saying that a, a passenger car is not the right product to proliferate this technology. They think it will be through like X, the Exient fleet and stuff like that. Um, but how it works is um, at the front, it's got kind of like this grid um, that is made of. Um, like I think they were saying that the membrane is made of tin yep. and platinum. That's it. It's and, a membrane. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, so on one side, they pump in uh, like the outside air and on, and on the other side of the membrane, they pump in um, hydrogen and the sort of difference between the two yes. stuff happens. Um, I, th I think between... it's officially called scientific and engineering voodoo. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Is, yeah. how it, is how it actually happens. Well, is, yeah. yeah, isn't that what they say? Like anything that's scientifically advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. That's um, it. So, something yeah, like that. that. So magic yeah. happens, and then yes. the two byproducts are, as you say, water and electricity. And it's got a buffer lithium ion battery, um, and it has a really similar motor to the one in the Kona Electric. So it drives just like an electric car. Yeah, and it's, it's nice to drive. It's comfortable. It's it's like light. It's silent. It's it's a nice. Well, that's it. To just to circle back, it's what James May said all those years ago. It was early aughts or something like that when he was driving this Clarity, and he was saying the thing about the future, if this is it, is it's just like driving a car right now. Yeah, <laughs> you know that there's not a hell of a lot of difference. So interesting that that's still the takeout. I think it's not, I, it's not a foreign thing the next so it's a it's a mid-size suv you know it's so relatable in terms of like a product i think i think that's one of the issues uh i find with tesla is that i instantly feel like the dumbest kid in the class as soon as i get into a tesla because i'm like where's the steering wheel like where <laughs> what, 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 where you know like because everything is just so you know museum of modern art in a tesla that i f instantly feel like you know it's i'm not in a car exactly um, with, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. That that has mm. implications in terms of adoption. Mm. Um, you know, early adopters are going to love a Tesla because it is that. It is yes. so different. Yeah. Whereas your mass market is going to be more drawn to something that's probably familiar and and uh, you know more relatable. 
That's right. I'd like. I look. I reckon. I'd like to see Toyota start. You know, forget the Mirai. I want to see them. I want to see. Right. <laughs> I want. To I'm see. just getting the <laughs> prediction roll. Uh, a land, ready. a bloody Land Cruiser hydrogen powered car. Mm, right. That's that. That's the future. Cool. Hydrogen well, Land Cruiser. Who's yeah, to say? Runs on hydro, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah, de- definitely, yeah. and and that's even what uh, like you, you know Hyundai's mm. hinted at the fact that um you know a future pickup truck will be hydrogen powered because it makes way more sense oh, than it does as an EV. A- absolutely, absolutely, mate. Okay, I love it. Very good. Well, thank you, Tom. That was a great discussion that went into uh, areas that I didn't think it would. So, well what have done. you been driving? What have you been driving? Oh me, yes. Yes. I'll just rattle through a a Porsche Cayenne GTS. So it's. Oh. Towards the upper end of the KN range, but it's not your turbo yeah. and, and all that stuff, or, although it is turbocharged. <laughs> um, it's a four litre twin turbo petrol V8, in fact. Uh, 338 kilowatts, 620 newton metres, eight speed Tiptronic, all wheel drive, 192 grand. Wow. 192,500 before you put it on the road. And the overall, I could go into the detail, um, but for me, it's, it's a reinforcement of a thought that I've had for the last few years mm. for what it's worth that Porsche is now fully under fully understanding this SUV thing. I think they made the original KN because it was sort of a, a commercial imperative to, to broaden their brand and appeal to more people so that they could still make the sports cars that they really understood. We'll just do this thing over here. And it didn't, this, this now feels like a Porsche. Yeah. Um, it's fast, it's balanced, the seats and the seating position, it feels Porsche. Um, and it delivers its performance so smoothly. It's, it's beautifully refined. The powertrain is just silky, but, but exciting at the same time. And inside, you've got these screens. It's Porsche's up to updated its game in terms of how the ergonomics work and how everything's operated. So if you're into a high-performance SUV and you're ready to spend that kind of money, that's in, in your, your market, you're looking at things like a, a Merck uh, AMG, a GLE 63S for a little more. It's about 220 an X5M competition from BMW, 209, Audi SQ7, bit less, 162 and a bit. So there are plenty of players in that market and there are Mm. plenty of people ready to spend that kind of money on an SUV. It's not my cup of tea. That's just a totally subjective personal opinion. But the only things I could really find against it was it's in this paint called Moonlight Blue Metallic, which frankly is black. Um, until the sun really beats into it and then it comes up blue. Mm. But, but most of the time, it just looks like a black car. Isn't there a um, BMW colour that's just like that? It has like these tiny little flecks of blue mica in it and they call it blue, but it's like mm. from yeah. most angles, mm. it's just black. Black. Mm. Um, so to me, it's sort of like, what's the point? You only get question, to see it though. as a blue car once once in a blue moon. Pardon I've got a question, JC. Pun. Pun. Yep. Now, you are a former race car driver. Only of the would, amateur variety. What? Who would win? What would win uh-huh. on a racetrack? Phillip yep. Island, right? Yeah. Your Cayenne. Yeah. The equivalent X5. Uh huh. Or what is it? GLE. Is that? Would that be the equivalent? Yeah, GLE? I think. Yeah. I, I think you did. You and I do a test once, Richard. I'm not sure. Um, where we had similar vehicles, but of previous generations. Yes. At yes. We Sydney, did. Sydney Motorsport Park. Yep. Yep. And I was actually really surprised at how good like an X5 BMW mm. in this performance setup was. Yeah. So, and they've only got better since then. Yes. Um, I, I, it'd be a close go, but this, this Porsche would be right there. It's beautifully tuned. I mean, it, wouldn't it, you it, think that dynamically Porsche, great. Porsche is a you know, race focused brand that, yeah. it, that the Mercedes would be about comfort and luxury yeah. The BMW would probably be a bit of both and the Porsche would be straight out performance. I suppose it's just the evolution of Porsche as a business um, yeah. and as a brand, what it means to different people. Um, for purists, it'll always be 911 yeah. um, with a bit of 718 on the side. Yeah. Um, but for others, it's more luxury. It's more the, the brand statement. And I want a bit of fun yeah. in my premium SUV rather than it being a flat out sports focused thing. How did it go with the Bram test? Your mate, you're the purest Porsche mate. What's his oh, view on it? It's fun. funny. He didn't see it, but I did mm. take the 911 Turbo S to show Bram and we did yeah. a uh, you know a private road launch uh, yep. control start mm-hmm. and it started to turn him around. He refers to Porsche as the company formerly known as Porsche. <laughs> so when, 
when the 911 went to water cooling um, yep. in the mid to late 90s, that business ceased to exist for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's starting to see it come back on the horizon. I mean, that that nice. is amazing. He's just yeah, he was fairly flustered after that launch and thought um, this could this is an interesting case. There's some potential but here. He yeah. doesn't. <laughs> yeah, normally he flips the bird at a KN. Um, right, and the okay. lights. He, he just is dismissive of that part. Of and what, what does he steer? What's he pilot? Oh, well, his car is a 1967 911S, Australian cool. delivered, sunroof, beautifully restored. Very nice. Amazing. Yeah. 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 He, he alleges that Jerry Seinfeld is aware of his car. Really? Hmm? It certainly takes a large pair of watermelons to drive a car like that at speed. Sure. Hmm. Sure. Mm. Yes, and mm. rock melons as well. Any any of those <laughs> any any fruit any of those yes. that, that fruit family. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that that was terrific. Thank you, uh, guys. We've covered the garage. What we will do is just cover off a bit of feedback from last week, and it was all about um, look. We and first to say we had a lot of feedback. Thank you very much. And sorry we can't cover it all, but I've cherry picked a few, and it was about Mazda pushing up into a more premium space in Australia anyway. And I think uh, FBG Coot, uh, I'm not sure if I'm missing something there, but it's F- <laughs> FBG Coot, um, summed up a lot of people's views when he said Mazda is a fantastic automaker. There's a new dr- there are new drivetrain and ad company sacking away from taking a nice chunk out of VW and becoming the new 90s Honda in the 21 to 35 year old premium and I presume <laughs> demographic. Um, BMW's new Beaver face will cost its sales in the West. And that's a really great point. I'd forgotten the impact of China, you know, as, a, as an influencer on car design and, and global sales. And if you think about making a brand statement, there's nothing like an enormous grill uh, to do that. Um, MBs look like three versions of the same car, small, medium, and large. Audi will gain from that with the right products, Mazda can too. And I thought that was a really uh, well-considered piece of feedback on, on our chat. Mm. Um, I agree. And then like Audi, yep. right? The, you could level the complaint at Audi for so long that the design was just sort of, you know, the same car scaled different ways. Yeah, true. Yep, true. Yeah, but yep. now, like, you look at new cars, like, like the Q3 looks awesome now. Like, it's a really yes. unique product that owns Audi, but it's also its own thing. I, I true. really like that about the And I think, I think it's worth pointing out that we did call that out at the time. Um, yeah, we did. Sometimes there's a lot of revisionism, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it was at the time we were saying, no, nah, these are too similar. Um, <laughs> that there's got to be more differentiation. But, but they point. really were, you know, when the yeah. A3 came out, they all look like the same car just from different distances away. True. So, mm. yeah, maybe Merck's suffering a bit of that, particularly not, mm. Mm, yeah, well, SUVs, sedans, the, the whole bit. Um, yep. But then on the dislike side of the scales, uh, Michael McLeaf says, personally, Mazda is more like a pig with lipstick. Um, I remember, he says, I remember the GLC, which is the great little car. Now, I, I didn't really know about this, but in North America, um, apparently the third generation, what we saw is the 3T3. Japan was the familiar um, in the late 70s, was called the great little car, the GLC in America. And he said, and the 626, adequate, but nothing special. Current models are tired and not modern. Admittedly beautiful design, but underneath the same old pig. Um, The most significant development has been adding turbo. Here in the US, Mazda needs a big SUV, CX-11, and a halo performance car. Instead of going upscale with their current lineup, they need to focus on modernizing and being relevant. Yeah, that's true. Well, so in America, the CX-9 is not considered a large SUV. It's considered a midsize. So, you bet. And, and he's absolutely right. Like, you know, they need, a, again, a Palisade competitor over there for Mazda. Yeah. Do you guys, so, do you guys know if like, do they, Mazda have a factory in America? Because that's one of the things that's been a big advantage for Subaru and Hyundai sure. is they're actually able to build Palisade yeah, and Ascent. Design in, centers there and factories there. Um, yeah. yeah, I think they have a few dealers. We've got a couple of dealers. Look, I think I wouldn't say it's lipstick on a pig. Mazda is really good at making um, things look beautiful on a budget. Uh, So whereas, you know, Toyota is quite good at making things look budget on a budget and Mazda is really good at making a a really lovely interior and exterior of a car. Well, Um, yeah. yeah. The other thing is I'm as gullible as the next person. I am, Mm. you know, pretty gullible, frankly. And um, when you think about the whole Sky Active push in Mazda, 
Yes. All right, maybe that's marketing mumbo jumbo, but there was a genuine engineering focus on lightweighting, aero mm. efficiency, optimizing uh, economy and, and efficiency in the engines that was wringing the last drops out of, you know, uh, non, non or naturally uh, aspirated engines. And I think that was a real push with Mazda. I'm willing to believe that they were really trying hard on that score. Yeah, look, you were watching the fuel economies drop and drop and drop and drop. Um, but maybe it was also a bit of, you know, marketing spiel in that we're going to be asked over the next few years where our EV is. Um, why don't we tell people that we're concentrating on getting the yeah. most we can out of petrol yeah, engines? That's right. That's right. <laughs> See, I feel for it. I feel for it 100%. No, but look, look, at the same time, they have gone a long way to you know, reducing those emissions. Um, you know, their two litre four cylinder engine is really fuel efficient. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, and now we're starting to see Mazda EVs. So um, I think yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said optimization, JC. Yeah. I think I think that's uh, you know what it comes down to. It's okay. Well, you know, we want this engine family to last X amount of time until we can get a production EV happening or a hybrid, whatever it is. Yes. Um, but I think the most interesting thing about um, Sky Skyactiv X um, is, which is you know quietly supercharged. Um, Apart yeah. from the fact that it's got that cool, you know, combustion cycle, it's just quietly supercharged. Um, yeah. It does have a little bit of sort of mild hybrid stuff cooked in. And, and the thing I found about driving it was if it just had a bigger lithium ion battery and an electric motor on one of the axles, it would have been a great hybrid. Right. Like why wasn't it? It was, yes. all, it was, it was sort of, I don't know, a third of the way there, just a little bit further. And I, great, I think that's what point. we're going to see from, you know, Mazda in the future is you'll see those kind of like high efficiency combustion engines great in the point. hybrid system. Great point. Now, we also touched on Mazda's um, position in the Aussie market anyway, being partly underpinned by their really solid retail network and the great, you know, customer service. And we got a lot of feedback on that. And one of them that I thought was terrific was Architect. <laughs> Architect came at us and said he enjoys the podcast. Thank you. Um, it's great. We're back on YouTube. It feels great to be back on YouTube. Um, a comment on customer service. Dealerships need to wake up to the fact that excellent service post-sales equals more future sales. Quick example, had a chip windscreen in my Range Rover Vogue quite a few years ago and was away from home on business. So called into the dealership to see where the nearest auto screen replacement firm was. Instead of leaving the dealership burdened with the problem, they simply checked the stock, took the car in, gave me a courtesy car, replaced the screen and sorted the insurance. Absolutely first class. I'd never been a customer of theirs before. So I thought if that's what they do and I wasn't a customer, what would it be like if I was? Answer, totally superb. And over the last 12 years, resulted in the purchase of three replacement Range Rovers, changed every three years. Family had two defenders and discovery. The power of good after sales customer service, I became a total fan of the dealership. And he actually references a book called Raving Fans <laughs> that underscores <laughs> this concept that people can become a raving fan. So he says, if dealers want to realise sales growth, invest in great post-sale service. It works. Um, so amazing. It's, great it's, story. It's so true, though. We've all been to, you know, um, you know a, a, a restaurant um, or, or wherever, a shop, and we've got bad service and we've mm. never gone back. That's right. Um, That's and right. it's the same with dealerships as well. And they are not all the same. Yeah. Um, there are some really good ones and there are some ones which could be better mm. um, in terms of their service and, and what they do for their customers. And yep. you'll, you'll find the ones that are, have really good customer service are, are doing really well as businesses as well. Yeah. It's, so, it put mm. me in mind of the analogy I thought of was real estate agents mm. and they have their property management oh. bit. And they yes. put their juniors on that yep. uh, because it's, you know, it's not mm. a, seen as not a particularly challenging task. Of course it is. And if you own a property and you're renting it out and you get great service from that agency, who are you going to mm. list your, your place for sale with? And if you're a tenant Absolutely. and you feel great about the agency that you've been, you know, working with and you go to buy a house, who are you going to yep. go to first? It's an absolute kind of sales recruitment area. Absolutely. Um, and it's the same in cars, I reckon. Car manufacturers um, spend a lot of time retraining staff. Ford, over the last five years, had a, had a, had a major, um, it sounds like we're Ford bashing here, but they, a couple of years ago, they, they decided to completely retrain all their staff because they, they realised that, that they probably weren't doing things the way they should. 
And so they didn't know they were working for a car company. They were doing <laughs> something else. They, they, they spent millions outdoor of dollars furniture and just retraining staff about how to how to how to customer service. And it sounds silly, but there's an, a bit of an art to it. Um, sure, so things are a lot different now. But sometimes you can't just rely on your staff being nice people. You've got to teach them how to you know, yep. serve customers properly. So yeah. I think, I think there's a degree of like, this is part of the success of Tesla, right? Like anyone who buys a Tesla kind of has this, it's like a tech showroom experience, you know, when you go to a, a Tesla Apple place, shop. it is, it's like the Apple shop, you know, there's just the one car there and, you know, there's a lot of uh, manufacturers moving to this kind of uh, retail display model instead of, yep. uh, you know, a traditional dealership because it's seen as much more consumer friendly and everything's set and there's no bartering and there's no, that, but yeah. I think it's the consistency, right? So with a car dealer, you never know what you're going to get, even, whether it's sales, uh, you know, used cars or, um, you know, the parts service and service or whatever. Parts yeah. and service, you never know what you're going to get. You know, you're going to get a nice place. You're going to get an old place with angry people. You never know. And so the thing with Tesla is it's just not, everything is consistent. You get the same thing. The car even updates itself and has these big changes overnight. And that's, I think, part of the reason why anyone who buys one becomes this acolyte because it's this, inclusive wholesome experience that true, is like true. a tech product you know well it, it's interesting you know because um our old mate de cool had a similar kind of story ah. before he he is famously a cx5 owner and before yeah. he went to to buy that car is this to de cool okay? correct yeah yes well that's your pet name for him um, richard and he'd been to a, a four dealer honda dealer toyota <laughs> during the pandemic um and they didn't even know whether they could open or not let alone yeah. show him a car um, Subaru, he made him choose between a Forester and an Outback to even sit in. Um, test drive, not on the cards. Nissan, Hyundai, Mitsubishi, they'd, they'd let them see the cars but had to come back on a weekday for a test drive. Mm. Uh, Mazda sales showed us, gave us the full info on a few variants. Test drive, no problem, um, despite the fact that uh, de Kork had an overseas driver's licence at that time. Even stayed longer to seal the deal, blah, blah, blah. And he's become a massive Mazda devotee and he, he loves the, the product as well. And it put me in mind of when I was a junior burger at, um, at a, a, a particular, um, uh, well, it was Mercedes-Benz. And I was, I was working with Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> and um, we were out in regional New South Wales, Midwestern New South Wales. There was a subsidiary um, in Dubbo, um, which is on the plains out there in New South Wales. And I went with the boss of that place. He said, come on, James, we're going to go and sell these people a tractor. And I went, oh, okay, fantastic. And we jumped in the car and on the way out to the property, he told me, look, these are two sisters um, I've been dealing with them for, for many, many years. I've sold them a John Deere. I've sold them a New Holland. I've sold them an International Harvester. He'd been in tractor retailing for some time. And now we're going to sell them an MV track. And we did. Went out there and they were just ready to buy whatever yep. he wanted to sell them because they trusted him implicitly. They yep. knew that they would get a, a, a good deal, a good product, and it would be well taken care of when they were dealing with him. And I thought it was really instructive. Well, this is the thing because people are parting with a lot of money here. They, they feel a little bit vulnerable um, and they feel like they're at the mercy of this person they don't know who might talk them into something. So when they find someone they can trust, mm. you know, they stick with them. It's yep. like real estate agents. It's like everything, hairdressers, everything. You I mean, mean, that's I've stuck hopeful. with my hairdresser for many, <laughs> Look, many years. Don't leave them. They're doing a great job, JC. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's what that is without blowing, you know, our, our, our collective trumpet. Uh, what you know our website's about like it's actually providing people with information so they can go to a dealer and they can know more about that car than the dealer yeah maybe um when they walk yeah. in and make a yeah. informed choice so yeah but with that, yeah. that's that that's the thing as well right it's, it's one of the things that's kind of missing from our experience is having that retail of going in and, and sure. talking to a dealer and trying to get a car out of them and yeah. i had an experience i think it was a couple of years ago now where a friend of mine wanted to buy a brand new uh you know uh, standard sized hatchback the choice was i30 uh master 3 and corolla but it was the before the current gen corolla launched and the most interesting thing you know you were talking about mazda before having great customer service we walked into the mazda dealership and i just said i want this car in this spec and you know with these features and i want to drive it now and the, the guy was just like cool goes to the draw gets the keys gives them to us and says see you later i don't care when you come back and you never came back. You've still got that car. <laughs> still, yeah, that's right. It's very, and you know, fun, fun, funnily, funnily enough, you know, he ended up buying the i30 anyway because he liked it better. But the, yeah. for for me, uh, uh, you know, having that dealer just 
say, fine, you can have exactly what you want. Here you go, drive it, take for as long as you want. That was great. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, Paul Victor, our last commenter that we'll, we'll um, um, deal with today, said he has a CX-5. He loves the 2.2 litre engine. He loves the car. Mm. And we also he also has a Toyota. And both dealerships are a block apart and owned by the same group. Yep. Um, the service couldn't be further apart. Wow. And based on our experience, our friends bought a CX-8 rather than RAV4 because they don't want to deal with the Toyota dealership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that's just a localised thing. Who yep. knows? People are individual. People are people. Um, that's his experience. But one point he did make last week, and I, I thought I should point this out, um, another commenter last week, Jaylene Andrews, had made some comments about Hilux engines and um, diesel particulate filter problems and, and whatever else, and also mm -hmm. crack pistons crack pistons and that was news to us and uh paul said look um crack as for crack pistons in toyota there are quite a few but the older previous three liter diesel engines 90 percent of them has a chip tune or shot injectors uh, that didn't get replaced in time um, same with any brand so i think that's a fair comment mm -hmm. um Jalen was talking about warranty claims and it's a question of whether those claims actually get up um, mm -hmm. they might be made but whether they're paid is another question so um important Absolutely. to make that point yeah so I think that's that's the feedback. That was uh, that was really cool. good. Thank you guys. And um, in terms of feedback, it's time for Musk Watch. <laughs> all right. First of all, um, I love. Musk watch. It's my favourite part of this podcast. Full, full transparency here, and uh, I'll make a declaration. I'm a big Jason Torchinsky fan. He is um, the editor and overall controller of Jalopnik in the States. Big fan of his. He wrote a story during the week, um, and it was headed, SpaceX Starship continues streak of highly successful explosions in recent tests. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. what this all boils down to is, uh, he says SpaceX's latest test of their prototype Starship S and 11 upper stage came to an exciting and unfortunately familiar end earlier today when the rocket exploded as it attempted SpaceX's signature and impressive vertical landing. So they've been doing these what are called hop and land tests. So they go up to high altitude, come back, see if they can land it. Um, and it blew up. And that's a, that's a process SpaceX is getting very good at, according to uh, Jason. <laughs> And he says, Elon Musk, the reclusive, barely known CEO of SpaceX, even managed to have a pretty good line about the explosion, noting that at least it exploded in the right spot. And yes, Elon was on Twitter saying, at least the crater is in the right place. <laughs> um, and Richard, you and I were talking about this before yeah. the podcast. It blew up and debris went eight, up to eight kilometres away. And for people... Yep. On YouTube, there are a couple of images there, one from RGV Aerial Photography. A big chunk of this thing has yeah. landed on a row of carports. And this photographer, Lab Padre, his setup, tripod camera, some, some sound recording equipment, he's in the debris field. There are pieces of Starship all around him and he's kilometres yeah. away from where this thing is. It was foggy but it was an enormous explosion. I, I you know me, I'm a, I'm a spaceman. I am... Um... I actually um, watched the live feed of SN11 taking off and um, God, it's so different to watching a NASA launch because NASA is so, so, so professional in terms hey, of yeah, boy, Dudley do right. They don't, they, they don't ham it up in terms of SN11's like, okay, so here we go. We can watching here is launch of the SN11. It's um, light the candle. When it <laughs> exploded, and it obviously did because the feed just stopped. And the, pres <laughs> the, the presenter, because that's the only term for the guy commentating, right? He's like, well, it looks like we've had another very exciting test. Um, <laughs> that was impressive. We've uh, had a, you know, we'll be back again. And obviously this is just a test, a very exciting one. And it's just like, it's just like, come on. Uh, what a NASA, um, you know, launch controller would say is that there's been a you know catastrophic mal malfunction right and there's yes. nothing wrong in saying that because sure. it absolutely is when it explodes yes. but the footage of it exploding was um i, I found on a twitter feed somebody else's twitter feed because it obviously had been cut 
Um, everything went really well in terms of reaching the altitude it um, was supposed to be at. It was a really foggy day and then it came down again. Everything was fine and then the, and then the, the feed just froze. Um, Which has just happened the last few times. That's yeah. it. Look, this is the thing. But the explosion, right, was violent. So it was in this, it looked like, like something out of um, Sleepy Hollow. Um, wow. It was this foggy, marshy field and then things just started to fall all over the place. And it was like big, like palm trees falling out of the sky. Like, <laughs> and it was violent. Wow. It wasn't like a Hollywood one. It was like really like, oh, my God. Well, well it, yeah, the thing that the thing tornado. that stuck out to me was after the last blow up, which was funnily enough the SN10. Yeah, um, Elon said uh, there were multiple fixes would be applied mm. to the SN11. So sadly, despite those multiple fixes, none of them worked. Yeah, and it's been another big, big blow up. It's a thing. It's a thing with SpaceX though, because they test things by testing them almost like a silicon valley style run right. out an update and if it doesn't work we'll fix it with an you know with a patch or something like that All right. because nasa is so methodical and yeah. because it's taxpayer money things yeah. only blow up very rarely and when they do it's a huge thing that's so a good point that's a great point that, i think that's the thing right like when it comes mm. to nasa and ESA, there's so many like international and public stakeholders yes you know in place that and it's you know it's a great a point very up and down scientific kind of organization you know mm. these these traditional yep. space agencies or spacex is kind of like you know oh. as you say doing the pr on the fly you oh. know having this whole presenter attitude yep. to it it's it's such an elon it's, product isn't it it's roughly analogous with my history in rocketry which is um <laughs> a fairly laissez-faire attitude and yeah let's push it as far as we can yeah and look i mean things get done faster that way like you look at the progress of nasa over the well, god we haven't been back to the moon since 1969 right well not to, um, not to anyone's knowledge not to anyone's knowledge there's a complete city there um yeah. but the way uh elon's doing is a much let's just let's just make it happen let's force it right brute force really um yeah. rather than a slowly slowly carefully carefully approach that nasa takes and i yeah. think i think elon will be successful but there'll be a lot of knuckles skin, skin lost off knuckles and true you know, you know injuries <laughs> you it's know, a great explosions. point it's the diff- i think you make a terrific point the great difference between private enterprise and you know government enterprise yes. or you know yeah well, publicly government, funded government enterprise. is more accountable you know what i mean like you yeah. know if, yeah. if nasa's rockets kept exploding like this the whole space program would be shut down but True. because we've got an elon musk howard hughes style entrepreneur you know genius Not at, at, the, at yep. the wheel here yeah things will happen a lot faster but that's mm. because he's not being held as, as accountable as a, a government institution all right. Now, just quickly, uh, also, he posted up a meme, as is, um, you know, his, his common practice on Twitter during the weekend. It was a knight with a small girl reaching up to him. And it's labelled, and for people on YouTube, you ought to see it. And the knight is labelled, my dad. And the thought is, a dumb fact he already knew. And the little girl leaning up is six-year-old me. So like, oh, that's amazing, dad. And then the second panel is, 20-year-old me is the knight. And then the thought is, an unfunny video I've already seen. And the little girl is my dad. Like, oh, that's amazing. So, you know, there's the meme. And first up, I don't like this, said art by (laughs) W-O-L-P, by the way, as any stolen some art and not credited again. Um, Then the aptly named, although I don't really know, Horny said, any chance I can borrow a spaceship? I'm getting married in August. (laughs) (laughs) So instead of a wedding car, just wants a rocket. I wouldn't want one at the moment, actually, um, if the SN11 is any guide. Yeah. Ryan Fabin says, speaking of memes, I know you're a fun, bracket, slightly crazy, end bracket, dude, and so am I. That's why I would like to offer you $100 in Hoge, bracket, a cryptocurrency, end bracket, if you tweak about it. So obviously tweaking is a new form of social media that we're not aware of. And NJ just had a Dogecoin branded Starship on the platform ready to take off because <laughs> they all want him they all want him to mention a cryptocurrency so they can make some money oh, they just want him to make yes. uh, a mention of cryptocurrency mm-hmm. but speaking of share prices tesla is 635 it's about five dollars up from last week it was 630 but i read a story on the motley fool and it's a provocative headline this company will make more electric cars than tesla and antipodes portfolio manager allison savas 
says there is a better bet in the electric car field than Tesla, and it's Volkswagen Group, mm. uh, because they're finally cottoning on that they're being more aggressive and making big strides towards competing and overtaking, competing with and overtaking Tesla. Now, you probably clocked the Volkswagen um, you know, thing that was obviously meant to be a, an April Fool's stunt that was leaked um, earlier somehow. And Volkswagen is, of course, getting very serious about electric vehicles, as all mm. the, the big manufacturers are. But finally, here's a, a, a share market analyst that's waking up to this. Um, says, next year, Antipodes predicts both Tesla and VW will sell around a million EVs each. Then in the years beyond, VW will outsell Tesla. Any first mover advantage Tesla had is arguably vanishing. Mm. Um, and the Tesla bulls say, okay, well, Tesla's about more than just vehicles. It's developing yeah. autonomous driving and driverless taxis. But basically yeah. what this company is saying is, you know, Tesla hasn't solved these issues around autonomous driving. No one has. But ascribing half a trillion dollars of value to the company suggests success is guaranteed. And it's absolutely not. Mm. So they're finally saying, look, this is all just based on hope and ambition as opposed to anything concrete. And speculation. I'm 100% agreeing here. And I was just thinking this week, how many EV reveals have we seen for cars that are 100% oh. competitive with Tesla's now? Like before yeah. you could say, oh yeah, Tesla did have a competitive advantage because cars like Model 3, Model S were really, really advanced for their time. They had amazing range. They had yeah. amazing yeah. interior technology. But now look at cars like Ionic 5. <laughs> It's hard to see that car costing so much more than a Tesla that it will be unattainable or something like Although, that. Although, can I just say that uh, before, what was it, around about 2004, uh, mm -hmm. Apple didn't make phones. Mm -hmm. um, and you had Nokia, you had, say, yeah. you had, you had all these That's other brands. Point. Apple yeah. came along and now I would suggest, I would say that I, I would probably Android outsells Apple in terms of number of quantity around the world in terms of you know Samsung Galaxies and stuff like that. But iPhone would account for I reckon a forty percent of that market. So maybe Tesla will do the same thing. Great point. Great point. I, I, I agree. I, I think Tesla's made enough inroads now that it, it is going to be a mainstream manufacturer in the future. Like it, it, they've invested in the factories, they've invested in yeah. the technology, they've invested in everything to make that happen. And mm. that competitive advantage has made them that way. So now that going yeah. into the future, yeah, Tesla will just be another manufacturer. But to be to have the scale of Volkswagen, to have the scale of Toyota, yeah. like do we really yeah. believe this? And I, I think yeah. that's why there's so much speculation in the share price because well, people I, who m maybe don't. <clears throat> have that kind of, uh, you know, encapsulating view of the market might have- Oh, that's that. such a good point, Tom. I remember when we could all travel internationally, being in a hotel room somewhere at an ungod ungodly hour, watching a CNN business channel. And there was a, 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 an investor advisor just wholly taking it for granted that Tesla would have autonomous driving within 12 months. Yeah. Just, yep, yeah, taking that, sure, they said it's going to happen. So mm -hmm. we're, we're building that into our recommendation on the share price. And I'm there just going- no, 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 that's not right. So it's kind of refreshing to see someone just going, no one's got the answer to that yet. Yeah. Um, you, you can't bank that much money. Well, and you, know, you, you can say Tesla's that more, you know, it's about autonomous driving as much as it is about the electric drive components. But, you know, look at what China's doing. Like they're building like semi-autonomous taxis now. And if you want to talk about the idea, this idea of, uh, you know, what SpaceX is doing, just total trial by error, like let's put it out yes. there, see what happens. That's what China's really good at. Yeah, so really. they're going to be putting autonomous taxis on the road right now and yes. just saying, let's go trial by error. Let's just yeah. do it. Okay. And Elon's okay. got massive factories building Teslas in China. So he's in the right place at the right time. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, Tom, yeah, we'll he just... is, but he's got a threat, you know, like, like mm -hmm. if there's anyone who can sort of have the data and the, the facility to test in, in that way and, and overcome those hurdles, China's really good at it. So cool. I think he's got a thread on his hands there. Yeah, cool. just because he's silly doesn't mean he's not, you know, doesn't know what he's doing. So the, I think, that's, yeah. That's fair too. That's fair too. <laughs> now on that note, I think we have reached the finish line and I want to say thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. Thank you, guys. And Mr. Pritchard has been called away to a gathering at the family villa this week. Um, La Casa de Pritchard is an old windmill tucked away in a secret location in the wilds of Tasmania. 
He tells me these get togethers are generally equal parts confusing and violent. <laughs> he says the flight home often feels like leaving a war zone. Um, so thanks again to Mr. <laughs> Sullivan for stepping in to handle the production. His experience of last week has obviously made an impression because he's wearing a rather impressive gold military hat oh. and was earlier demanding that everyone salute him before turning the mics on. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, the other day, I was traveling down one of those spiral type car parks. As I set off on the top floor, I spotted a bloke smashing a car window and attempting to steal whatever was inside. Oh. On the second floor, I saw a young kid scratching a key right down the side of another car. Jeez. Then on the bottom floor, I saw a couple throw a load of rubbish out of their car window. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had to call the cops. It was just wrong on so many levels. Oh, God. That's terrible. Oh, I saw her coming and I still laughed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. That cheats us all.